Um, yeah, it's really fun seeing everybody rolling here from all over the place. Um, Gayla Kesla, Dafwala, uh, Nitnamuch, Nukwa, um, Gyawala Gilis, Gayla Kesla, Gigame, um, Makwala. Um, it's really nice to see everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Worthing. I'm the Coastal Projects Lead for Sierra Club BC. And I'm coming in from, from uh, the unceded Douglas Treaty territory of the Quagilth Nation here in Taikyulf. Um, and it is my distinct privilege and honor to, to have a conversation with these two wonderful human beings tonight. Um, I'll introduce both Plalitalas and uh, Alex in a minute here. Um, but uh, so we'll do introductions um, and then I'll pass it over to each of them for some sort of opening remarks on uh, the state of wild salmon, the future of wild salmon and where we're at right now um, to share some of those reflections. And then following that, I'll pose a few discussion questions. We'll be able to sort of move through a dialogue about, um, about wild salmon and fish farms and, and the health of wild salmon on the coast here. Um, and then we'll turn it over to questions from uh, everybody, from, from all of you. Um, and then wrap with a really uh, brief reading from Alex's new book that she's recently published. And, um, and then we'll wrap around uh, 8.30 or so. Um, so yeah, it's, it's my honor to, to introduce and, and, and share a conversation with Clalitlas Glendale. Um, she's my friend and colleague here at Sierra Club BC as our forest relations coordinator. Um, she played a critical role in getting fish farms removed from the major migration routes of wild salmon in Namgi, Smamaliklaka, Muskamala Zaudena territory, as well as Danakdal, Hoitlala migration routes of fish. Um, Chris is also a, a seasoned uh, wilderness ecotourism guide with incredible knowledge of bear ecology. She's a cultural leader in her community of, of Alert Bay, and, uh, and she's a proud auntie. Uh, Carissa, do you want to introduce yourself? Gila Kesla, Nugu Am, Fleslas, Yarishin Lacha, Denakdal, Klu Haida. Hi, my name is Fleslas. Um, my English name is Carissa, and I am from the Denakdal First Nation as well as the Haida Nation. And uh, I'm happy to be here tonight. Uh, it's nice to chat with Alex again. It's been a while, so I'm looking forward to tonight. Gayla Kessler. Thanks, Carissa. Um, Alex Morton is a, a longtime friend and someone I consider a mentor um, who I've worked, worked with on and off for over a decade now. It's, it's starting to add up starting with wild salmon and restoration work at Salmon Coast Field Station and then marching the length of Vancouver Island to get fish farms out back in 20, 2009. Oh God. Um, she's a biologist. She's a researcher, a grandmother, a wild salmon advocate, and a, and a published author, author. Alex. Hi, it's really great to be here. Um, it's an exciting time, you know, we know that things are, things are getting pretty serious, we're down to the wire, but people are responding in, in incredible ways. And so, yeah, I've really enjoyed working with both of these people. Um, and uh, yeah, we are making a difference. We're very, um, we're very much on the front line still, but it, it's, I, I think it's time to be hopeful. So Thank you so much for being here. I look forward to this. Thanks, Alex. As we all know, wild salmon are the backbone of the coast. They're the centerpiece of coastal food sovereignty and nutrition. They're the silver thread that ties together terrestrial and marine environments and ecosystems that remind us that these two environments are more integrated than they are separated. Orcas and bears alike both need salmon for their very existence. Estuaries, forests are the wombs and nurseries of salmon for both salt and freshwater environments. 
the temperature of river water kept cool by ancient rainforests will make or break their survival. As will the temperature of the ocean as adult salmon move between the Gulf of Alaska and nearshore waters. We have less control over the cumulative climate impacts on salmon at sea than we do in their nearshore and river habitats. And the three largest human impacts that we are able to manage are forestry and resource development in their spawning watersheds, commercial and sport fishing, as well as their exposure to pathogens, parasites, and disease, where they're exposed to industrial scale open net aquaculture. Today, our conversation will focus on the latter of these human impacts, being mindful of the fact that most, the most critical time to fight for wild salmon habitat in every phase of their life cycle is right now. But more than anything, wild salmon are suffering from a bad case of politics. So to kick it off, um, I'll just ask Carissa in a really, uh, or Tlalitlas, um, in a really open sense, can you share a little bit about the significance of wild salmon for Kwapakua culture? Okay. It plays a huge role in our community uh, of Alert Bay here. Uh, we used to be the, one of the main hubs uh, for the fishing fleet. Um, growing up, there was always tons of same boats. Um, you know, all families had their own same boat, their gill net boats. And, you know, that's what a lot of our families uh, relied on for not only food, but uh, for income to help support um, our families. And, you know, as a huge decline in wild salmon, you know, there's only a handful of people who still own their own same boats or gillnet boats. Um, our docks are pretty bare now. Um, I was fortunate enough to grow up with, you know, wild salmon. I was taught how to uh, not only fish, but uh, prepare and preserve fish uh, for the winter and that for my families. Um, you know, I'm very grateful that, you know, I got that opportunity and it's been one of my main um, reasons why I have done what I've done to try help save our wild salmon so that I can pass on what I've been able to learn down to my nieces and nephews, and my godchildren, um, because it, you know, before we used to be working on fish for days, you know, hundreds and hundreds of fish for all of our families all over the community. And now we're lucky if we get one to five fish. So it's like a huge um, difference compared to when I was younger. Um, but yeah, so that's been one of my main reasons for standing up and trying to save wild salmon so you know the next generation has the opportunity that I did growing up. Thank you. Alex I'm wondering if you could set the stage a little bit for us in terms of the state of wild salmon right now here on the coast. Well, the wild salmon of this coast are doing a bunch of different things. Some of them are doing incredibly well. We get huge returns to like the sockeye that go into Alberni Inlet, where there are no salmon farms. Um, every now and then a salmon run really turns on in a, in a totally unexpected way. And I guess the last time that happened was 2010 with the Fraser sockeye. Nobody expected 30 million fish to come back that year. But Many of the other runs are, are just about gone. Um, the Fraser sockeye, which were really the biggest run of salmon in the world and uh, one that people relied on for food and for income. And um, there were parts of the Fraser River uh, last year that had 27 of them come back. So we are looking at, we're, we're definitely looking down the barrel of extinction, but Every now and then they do incredibly well. And part of the research I do is 
looking at the juvenile salmon coming out of the rivers. And I just did this in the Discovery Islands a few weeks ago. And even with climate change and even with urban development, there are still a lot of young salmon coming out of these rivers. They are trying to make a go of it. And so, uh, yes, climate change is a huge issue and all the changes we've done to the landscape are a huge issue. But these fish are so remarkable that they're hanging on. And I just keep wondering, so what would happen if we fell in line with, with First Nation governance? Uh, so First Nation governments were actually built to protect wild salmon because the survival of the villages depended on it. They actually have mechanisms for it. What if, what if we were to fall in line and actually work with these fish? We're not going away. I'm not saying, you know, we all have to go away, but if we actually figured out what they need, I, I think we would see extraordinary returns. There's no, there's no evidence that we would not see extraordinary returns come back to this coast. Um, and so that's where we're at. We, we can either snuff them out right now, or you can shape up and, you know, do what they need and, and we could have abundant runs return. Do you have a sense of the time scale on that? Like, are you talking about a framing of five years, 10 years, two years, 20 years? Like what's right now? Well, there's runs going extinct every single year uh, going forward. Mm -hmm. When you have a return of 27 fish to the shoe swap, uh, yeah, that's extinction. So yeah, there isn't a time frame. It reminds me of like, hitting a fog bank. There's no hard line, kind of it's a soft thing. You don't really know where the boundary is and then boom, suddenly you're in it. And so uh, as a biologist, it's really tough because I can see the warnings. I can also see the potential for success. And, um, and that's why what happened in the Broughton Archipelago that Carissa was a huge part of, uh, it turned things around. And now those fish have a fighting chance. I mean, it, it's just, it is such an amazing story um, of hope. And this summer, the first fish will come back to the Otter River and other parts of the Broughton Archipelago that went to sea with the farms removed because of what Carissa and a, another, and a handful of other people did. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty extraordinary time. I'll, uh, I'll get to a reading of this book a little bit later this evening, but um, I want to first go into the Broughton. I want to go into these fish farms. Um, Tlalitla, talk about the first time you saw the conditions inside the open net pens um, and describe, describe what you saw. Describe what the salmon looked like. Yeah, um, I I still remember that day like it was yesterday. You know, once you see the condition of those fish in those pens, you know, you never get it out of your head. Um, and after living with them for so long, it really gets imprinted in there. But just the smell like right off the bat like that was the most disgusting thing ever you know not too many things like that get to me like that but that did um I didn't want to eat or drink for like the first few days of um getting on to the fish farm it was just too gross you know, seeing big chunks missing out of these fish, um, seeing some that were like mustard yellow, their eyes bulging, um, or two jaws, you know, it was just sad. And to think that all of these fish actually go out into the world and people actually eat them was even more horrifying to me because I would not eat that or I wouldn't feed that to a dog or any animal for that matter. Um, 
and just to see it like over and over and over again like tons of these fish there was always something wrong with each fish that I saw you know it wasn't just hand-picked or cherry-picked photos or videos um, that we took in from inside the pen like that was just all you could see like no matter what pen you looked into or if you went to you know Swanson or Midsummer or any other farm in the Broughton it was just all the same and yeah it was it was hard and just with how many of them were actually in our territory was just ridiculous um yeah Something I wish I could forget some days, but, you know, it's just the reality of them. And, you know, some people don't believe us, but, you know, you can go to any farm and see the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. So many of us have been following closely um, the fish farm issues and wild salmon issues for a long time. Um, and just to locate us here on the coast, um, Clalitlas and Alex in particular are talking about uh, the Broughton Archipelago or sort of central Kwakwakiwak territory. This would be an area near uh, Night Inlet and an archipelago of islands in between Night Inlet and the mainland of and, uh, and northern Vancouver Island. Um, so this is the, the center of the British Columbian coast in Kwakwakiwak waters. Um, but I want to sort of shift a little bit south for a second, because one of the most significant uh, kind of breakthroughs in uh, this story of fish farms and the impacts on wild salmon was when uh, Minister Bernadette Jordan, uh, the DFO, basically stepped up, or not the DFO, the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans, um, stepped up and actually listened to communities in First Nations um, in the Discovery Islands a little bit further south. Um, and it's, it's kind of a synopsis of, of a longer, you know, 30 year plus battle in a short, short time chunk. So Alex, I'm wondering if you could tell a brief history of the Discovery Islands, you know, when there were fish farms to the decision to uh, where we're at now and what we're seeing with the removal of, of uh, some of the restocking of those, those farms. Sure. So the reason the Discovery Islands are so important is because approximately one third of all of British Columbia salmon go through there. And that's simply because the Fraser River is so huge, a thousand kilometers with all species of fish, uh, of salmon and steelhead in there um, and the massive runs of pink salmon chum and, and sockeye. And they come out of that river and most of them turn north and go between Vancouver Island and the mainland, which puts them going through those narrow channels off of Campbell River, which is called the Discovery Islands. Now, there should never have been salmon farms. Salmon farms, as you probably know, are raising Atlantic salmon with up to a million fish per farm, one after the next, and sea lice are breeding on them and viruses. We, we, we now know there's a virus from Norway that's been spreading um, ferociously out of those farms now since 2010 at least, and bacteria. And so uh, I began my research in the Broughton Archipelago on the impact of uh, salmon farms on juvenile salmon because I lived there. But I began to wonder almost immediately what was going on down in Discovery Islands. And so I found a remarkable commercial fisherman and lighthouse keeper at Chatham Point. And he, he, he emailed me and said, uh, is there anything I could do to help? And next thing you know, he's, he's working all spring long um, with the beach chains, netting these fish so I can count the sea lice on them. So then last December, December uh, 18th, all of the federal licenses for the salmon farms in that area expired. And this is a thing that has happened frequently. And the industry just takes for granted that they're going to be renewed. But, you know, times are changing. The minister realized that she had to consult with First Nations, she had to really consult with First Nations. 
and there's seven with overlapping territories uh, in that general area. And so the consultation happened with all seven nations. And in the end, on the, the day before the decision, she announced that no Atlantic salmon, no farm salmon could be put into those farms ever again, which was shocking. Uh, that's 19 farms. All the, all the main industry is run by Norwegian companies, three Norwegian companies, and all of them were involved. And nobody's ever said no to them before. And so, um, I mean, I literally turned off the computer, turned off my phone. I needed to just go outside in the dark and light a fire and just think for a while because I, I, I wasn't, I didn't even know what the language was for something like this. Well, the salmon farming industry has now taken the minister to court. Two of the companies have, and you know, they're not leaving gracefully. But I went down there and uh, a few weeks ago and looked at the juvenile pink and chum and sockeye that were coming through. And, you know, when, when there's farms, the, the fish are just covered with these sea lice. They're on their eyeballs they're eating holes into their bodies, the fish are emaciated, they shiver when the lice move on them. But this year, they were fat and smooth and beautiful, and their eyes were not cloudy, they were black, black, black. And they were sassy, like they didn't want to go in the bag to be counted. Um, and because I, I let them go afterwards. But um, it was, it was incredible to see the difference in just one year. And the sockeye that went through were from the generation that went in to the Fraser in 2019, which was the lowest in the history of Canada, sadly, until last year, 2020, it got even lower. But I got to see their kids going to sea, and there were quite a few of them. So it's like, okay, this, was, this happened in the nick of time. And for the first time ever, I feel supported by my minister of fisheries, Bernadette Jordan. And if you feel like doing something, uh, there's a couple of things you could do, but one of them is you could just write her an email and say, thank you so much. And don't let these companies bully you around, please hold fast. So yeah, that's in a nutshell what happened there. And, and uh, it's just, it's miraculous because none of us really win environmental battles to save parts of this planet It's so rare. We have to accelerate this, this success, right? Otherwise, we're in bad shape. But to actually experience it, um, I mean, I've been fighting this industry my entire adult life. Like, my hair was black when I started this. And uh, so, yeah, it's quite remarkable. Thanks for that. Yeah, I, and of course, you know, minor wins like that in the journey of this work um are built over time um and social licenses are granted by people and by indigenous governance and by social movements and there's been 30 plus years of indigenous resistance to the encroachment of industrial salmon farming on the major migration routes of their wild salmon um and so this question is for Khaliflas. Um, as one of the core organizers and people doing the frontline work uh, with the fish farm occupation movement of a few years ago now, um, talk about why you chose to take action in that way um, and what that experience was like, right? In a way, I understand that as you enacting your rights to and your responsibilities to protect wild salmon for your own family, for the territory, for the wildlife, um, and of course for future generations. So what, what was the breaking point or when, when were you finally like, ah, screw it. You know, somebody needs to, somebody needs to take this style of action and just kind of, you know, go and bring my body into that space and occupy that. So can you share a little bit about about that experience of, of getting to that decision point to be like, nope, it's Occupy time. Um, well, before the occupation actually started, um, you know, there was multiple times where um, Alex and the Sea Shepherd crew and, you know, some of our people actually started going 
out um, to the farms out in the Broughton and, you know, giving eviction notices and doing um, cleansing ceremonies um, on different farms. And, you know, this went on for a while and, you know, nothing was happening. They weren't listening. Um, it was kind of just like, okay, whatever, you're only here for a few hours and then, you know, we don't see you again type thing. And, you know, it just got to the point where, you know, we needed to do something bigger, um, you know, and make people listen, you know, make our voices heard and, yeah, so um, Ernest Alfred was having um, meetings and stuff uh, here with the community. And, you know, we were going over different things, like what else can we do? Like we need to do something. And he was like, okay, I'm going out. I'm gonna stay out there until they're gone. And he said, who's with me? Um, I was sitting in the back of the community hall at that point and it was quiet. You know, like this was a lot to kind of like take in because we didn't know what that was gonna look like. We've never done, any done anything at that uh, scale and it wasn't until after the meeting, um, I went up to him and I said, okay, I'll go with you. You know, what? what's the plan? And we still didn't know at that point, but we packed our bags, packed the tent, whatever else we needed. And we headed out the very next day. And that was the beginning. We didn't think we were gonna have to be out there that long. I mean, I sure didn't. I thought, okay. How long, how long? I thought maybe two to three weeks <laughs> at most, <laughs> but I was- 280 uh, days, 280 yeah. days. <laughs> yeah, all all said and done. <laughs> and yeah, so, you know, it took 280 days until, you know, we finally, got somewhere and you know our voices were heard I was getting messages from people from all over the world um, supporting and you know it was a lot of emotions throughout the whole thing you know a lot of highs a lot of lows um, definitely took a toll on me for sure for being out there for so long having to go through all of the stuff from day to day, you know, angry fish farm workers to stupid security guards and stuff like that. So it was like, I definitely put myself through a lot. And what kept me going was uh, my niece that was at home. Uh, she was only, I think maybe three weeks old uh, when I started the occupation and you know that was the one thing that kept me going was you know my niece needs a voice and she's not old enough for that yet and you know that's my responsibility is to do what's best for her future and for the rest of the next generation and you know so I did what I had to do and you know Um, often we tend to focus on the political gains and the, the political kind of levers and moments in time and achievements and political wins. But by and large, those wins are where social movements cash in on what they've done and what they've built. And there's a lot of people that, um, that put their life force and their energy and make the sacrifices into movement building work 
um, like, like you're talking about Plelli class. And um, so I just want to take this moment to thank you for doing that, that work. Um, there's a, a lot of people that um, maybe will never know that you've done that, that will be thanking you for it in their own way. Um, and on a similar note in terms of, 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 of movement building for these types of um, environmental advocacy and, and, and land-based campaign stuff. Uh, it's often the case in social movement dynamics and in communities that women are the driving force behind social change, um, upholding ethical standards. Alex, can you share some reflections about this trend, especially with wild salmon advocacy? Uh, well, you know, I mean, <laughs> men do fabulous things too. And so I, you know, Stop. I never, never want <laughs> like you. Um, but, you know, in this case, you know, it was, what was required was endurance and, and grace. And I don't know if people, like I wrote about this in the book and this was the reason I wrote the book, but I don't know if people listening know that Carissa went on to the farm and built a small house and lived in it. Um, you know, I mean, that's pretty extraordinary. And there were young men that visited. In fact, I mean, Ernest, he was, he was the, the, uh, the first and, and endured the entire thing. But in general, the other occupiers were all young Indigenous women. And I remember David Suzuki uh, visited and asked, so where are the men? And the ladies are like, we don't know. <laughs> But they did come on occasionally, um, but it was just like, they were like caged animals. They, they just, they wanted to be doing something more active, but sometimes what needs to be done is just to, to sit there and endure and, and be immovable. Um, I learned a lot about activism over the years because I, I spent the first 25 years of this fight doing science, going to court, I went to the AGMs of the companies in Norway, um, I led a march all the way down Vancouver Island. I was in a canoe paddle with a hundred people for eight days on the Fraser River. But none of those things did anything other than linking us up, which was, was a good thing, but it was, the fish weren't benefiting at all from that. The farms were just getting bigger. And so uh, there's a difference between protesting and activism like is going on at Ferry Creek right now. I mean, I can't help but be mesmerized by that and, and be so grateful to people that are on those front lines and the ones that are moving through. Because even though we were out there, there were people who were sending blankets and boots. There was people sending dog food, money. Yeah. Um, there were people who were occupying uh, government offices in, in cities. In, in solidarity, which was absolutely huge. There were occupation tourists from Germany who make a lot of money and in their uh, vacation time, they know how important it is to save pieces of these planet. And they just go there and they just be. And uh, so, but, but the, one of the most important ingredients for success for something like this, and for us, what it was, was that there was a timeline that was ticking and the government was going to have to make a decision because we began the occupation in August, but June of the next year, all of the provincial tenures of those farms were expiring. And so now Horgan and his government had to make a decision. There was no just letting it slide. And the, the, one of the most, one of the many remarkable things that I saw during that time was the indigenous leadership uh, form around these people that were occupying the farms. And they stepped in, government was not going to talk to us, but they were, they had to talk to the leadership. And they went behind closed doors, which was very stressful for all of us on the front lines because there's that, that worry that they're gonna cave, but they didn't. And <laughs> this went on for a year after and finally they came out the other end and everybody had signed an agreement that the farms are gonna get out a few at a time and the worst ones first. Um, 
And now there's people who are actually doing that work. There's, there's crews, First Nation crews on the farms at the sea lice counts. Those fish are being checked for disease before they go in. So activism is this, this, this hugely complicated thing, but it, it works if you've got these timelines and then you've got leadership to step in and actually make the changes that need to happen. Um, but, you know, 25 years, nothing, nothing was working. The fish were going extinct. I was watching it, measuring it. It was just torture. And then it turned around. So I, I do want people to feel hopeful. You just have to be like incredibly creative, but also honorable. Like there was an altercation that um, Carissa got in with that security guard and they were actually pushing her and trying to get up a ramp. And she just put her arms across the ramp. And she's like, no, you're not going to go up here. And they're like, yeah, we can. She's like, no, you're not. And, and she held them off. She never hit them. She never yelled. Uh, and of course, somebody with a cell phone vi videotaped her and it, it went viral. Um, so the power in being honorable, being immovable, and being very, very clear with what needs to be done. It's absolutely our duty. Um, but I just want to reiterate, if you aren't a person who can step on the front line, there is a lot of ways you can support those who are on the front lines. So we all, we all absolutely have a role in this. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Krista, did you want to talk about that that standoff at all or uh yeah i can I've been getting asked that quite a bit lately so <laughs> um yeah um that day um it was actually only myself and two other people at the swanson occupation um the Marine harvest or Maui workers um, and the security guards there thought that I was hiding Ernest up in our camp, <laughs> um, which was ridiculous because it's never me who goes to deal with them when they try to show up. It was always Ernest. Um, so the fact that it was me that time you know, it just went to show that, you know, Ernest wasn't there at the time. And um, they just wouldn't take no for an answer. Um, they wanted to go scout out our camp, um, see how many people we had. Um, and they wanted to serve Ernest um, papers, which were actually outdated that we found out days later when they actually were able to serve him here in Alert Bay. Um, but yeah, so I was live on Facebook uh, minutes before giving a brief update. Um, and then I seen the boat approach. Uh, so I stopped my live because I was going to lose uh, Wi-Fi down the dock. Went down, um, was recording with my cell phone. Um, one of our occupiers um, recorded for me and yeah, they got off the boat. Uh, they came storming towards the ramp to head up. Um, I stopped and I held my hand out and said, no, you can't go up. You don't have permission. The argument went back and forth. Um, reliving that day is a bit weird, um, hard. Uh, there was a lot of stuff said. Um, threats were made. And, you know, I held my ground. I stopped them, which you know, definitely wasn't easy. Um, I did injure myself during that. And, you know, I still suffer today with those injuries. Um, it, 
it was intense and it was almost like I was almost watching myself as it was happening like it was obviously me but it was almost like I was also out of my body watching everything and I was pretty amazed at myself that I kept <laughs> my composure so well um <laughs> you know, with the amount of stuff that was said from that security guard, you know, a lot of people would have, you know, yelled or punched them out or, you know, something. But I knew that I had to compose myself because, you know, whatever I said or did, you know, they were going to try use that against me and against the fight. So, you know, I kept myself calm for the most part and just kept stating facts. Um, didn't give them any reason to be able to twist my words around or anything. And finally, at the end of it, um, they finally left the dock and went back to the farm. And I did try to come home and charged them after I went to the hospital, got checked out and stuff like that. But um, the police did say that because I stopped and I put my hand out and they walked into my hand that I made first contact so I couldn't charge them with assault. Wow. So uh, that ended right there. Um, so that is still frustrating to this day but you know I've come to terms with it and you know we're on the upside right now and you know as Alex been saying you know our fish are still fighting strong and you know I don't regret anything that happened out there you know it helped us get to this point and if I had to I would do it all over again Nice. Well, I was watching that live feed. Um, and I can tell you now that I was yelling, I was screaming at the, the camera. <laughs> um, and it was that that uh, made my mind up that I would um, come and spend some time at the occupation as well. And so it was basically two days after I saw that live stream that I was like, all right, I got to go and pay my respects to these, these fine folks. Um, Switching gears a little bit, I know it's kind of, it's an exciting time for wild salmon right now uh, in relation to fish farms as things are changing and as these licenses are coming, are expiring. Um, but a lot of the damage has been done in a lot of places. And I know it's cumulative impacts. It's, you know, largely fish farms, but it's cumulative impacts as well. But um, again, for Tlaliklas, um can you share some of what we've been seeing in terms of the impacts on wildlife um, that are dependent on wild salmon in the territory um, because of the declines? Yeah. Um, so after, you know, I was um, done with the occupation and stuff like that, I did go back to school. Um, I did a Aboriginal ecotourism program uh, through NIC and BIU, um, partnered with the Health of Nations. And that was a year long program, um, which we did uh, multiple courses to get all the certificates and whatnot to be able to work in the tourism industry. And then for my internship, um, I started working with Seawolf Adventures and, you know, they're Indigenous owned and operated. Um, and I got to go into my homelands um, quite often, which is Night Inlet. And Glendale Cove is one of the places that we go to um, do grizzly bear viewing. And 
you know, just the fact that we had to mainly um, watch the grizzlies and the black bears and that feed on the intertidal zone um, instead of, you know, being able to really go um, into the river system to actually see them fish um, was crazy. Um, I've never been able to witness that myself. And it was hard seeing them, you know, only having to feed in the intertidal zones and in the estuaries and see them struggle to be able to, you know, get fat enough for um, the winter when they go into hibernation. And, you know, a lot of the bears were moving out of uh, the mainland onto uh, different islands in the Britain Archipelago and a couple of them even made it here to Alert Bay because, you know, they're just moving around constantly trying to find food. Um, you know, it's definitely hard to see. And, you know, a lot of things depend on our wild salmon, not only us as First Nations people, but, you know, all of our animals and forests around us because you know they all play a major role and yeah it just keeps me going to fight more for our wild salmon so that the rest of the world can you know benefit and see how much wild salmon are important Alex, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role of science in the politics of conservation today. Oh, yes. So, of course, the science is very important because you, you look at something and you figure out what it's doing, what variables are affecting it. Um, you take something out of the ecosystem, you see what happens, it gets put back, you see what happens. And in, in the best of, you know, the best of our world, the government would be looking at that science, just like we did through COVID. I mean, the COVID um, epidemic has been so interesting to me. It's been many things, but it's been interesting to watch our Minister of Health, Adrian Dix, listening to Dr. Bonnie Henry, and they are modeling everything that happens. They close a school, they open this, they use a vaccine, and mathematical modelers are generating the curve. Where, where is this going to go? How do we bend the curve? And so I know that, that the government actually can do this. And, and we need to be doing this uh, with our fish. So there's this extraordinary science that is being developed in DFO that can actually read the immune system of fish. And what our immune systems do is when we face something, whether it's starvation or a bacteria or just stress or anything, our immune system picks up different tools. And the way it does this is it has all these switches and it just upregulates certain proteins that will be used to protect the cells from whatever's going on. Interestingly, this is like a language that crosses all living creatures. Um, our cells all respond, whether we're a fish or we're an elephant or we're humans or we're a dog, the patterns are really, really similar. And so if you, if you use this science, what we can do is we can uh, take these readings as the fish are migrating down the river, past the cities, past our factories, past the salmon farms, through different environments, and the fish can talk to us. Of course, First Nations will say, well, they've been doing this for, you know, as long as we've lived together for thousands and thousands of years. And so we're just catching up to that now. And when you find that the fish is fighting, uh, whether it's high water temperature or bacteria or virus or starving, then it's up to us to try to figure out how to change our behavior to allow the fish to have an easier time in that area. 
And when we do that, we can go back to the fish, we can take that little sample again, and the fish can actually tell us whether we made it better for them or not. So this is the way that humans can live with everything. I mean, all the, all the creatures can talk to us. We should be, it's called genomic profiling. We should be profiled because the first time we're fighting a disease when our bodies first experience it, our immune systems are turning on. And if we were reading that signal, we could deal with it. So it's an incredibly powerful tool. Um, unfortunately in DFO, it is, it is being suppressed because it's also a brutally honest tool. It doesn't lie. It's the fish talking themselves. And in many cases, they, they are responding to the salmon farms. Every time there's a disease issue that comes up, the question is, what is going on in the farms? The fish are more infected by the farms. They're responding by the farms. Now, the good news is we can take these farms out. We can put them on land. And this is happening really everywhere in the world except British Columbia. So I, I would want to ask the salmon farming industry, why is this? Um, but uh, the other very powerful thing for the powerful role that science has is when somebody stays in one place for a long time and watches and records because things are changing so fast on this planet. If, for example, people don't know that the Northern resident orca used to use the Broughton Archipelago. It, it was the exclusive territory of the A5 pod. Other groups could visit if they were escorted by the A5s. The A5s exclusively used it during the winter when fish are much more scarce. And then they got displaced in approximately 1995 by the acoustic deterrent devices that were played on the farms to try to keep the seals away. So um, it's only when you do these long-term studies that you really understand, begin to understand how these patterns are changing and how we are affecting them. And when it comes to the fish farms, I've been counting sea lice on juvenile salmon in the Broughton Archipelago since 2001. And I am now studying what happens when you take the farms out. So uh, it's, it's a very powerful tool, but it is easily corrupted. Everything is corruptible. So um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a significant challenge. And I can see it's a significant challenge for our minister to try to sort out what the fish really need. <clears throat> I spend a lot of my time uh, thinking about and working on uh, the biodiversity crisis, um, carbon sequestering forests, ancient old growth ecosystems, karst landscapes. Um, and one of the things that's been the most frustrating is the, the lack of political leadership to actually heed the science and to actually make science-based decisions um, on anything land related or resource related. Um, and in particular, one of the frustrating components is this multi-jurisdictional layer of different colonial governments kind of vying for different political outcomes between themselves. Um, you know, whether it's the federal government with an Endangered Species Act legislation in Kosiwik and the provincial government that actually is permitting the destruction of those, some of the last biodiversity uh, that's left, uh, you know, on Turtle Island in this part of the world in the coastal temperate rainforests, not having an endangered species legislation. There's, it's just a complete mess of jurisdictional layers. Um, what are the pieces for wild salmon that the federal government should be doing and the provincial government should be doing? And this is a question for both of you. Um, Um, okay, well, I'll go, I'll go first so you can think about it. <laughs> um, in, in my view, and, and really this is just personal experience, but it is a deep personal experience <laughs> considering it's been going on for three decades. The non-Indigenous government is going to have to give the power over the fish to the First Nation governments. And that doesn't mean that it has to go to a single First Nation governing body because the way I understand it, the First Nations never organized that way. They were heads of houses who had to deal with each other, who had to figure things out, which was 
I'm sure extremely difficult, but also far more democratic, honestly, than what we have now. And I mean, I, 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 <laughs> the difference is so stark for me between talking to the, like right now I, I do work for the Namgis as a advisor and in this process of taking the farms out. And the question they ask me is what, what do the fish need? That is the only question I have to ask and, or sorry, to answer. But to be able to answer that question to a government who has the power to make change is absolutely astonishing for me. I'm like, oh, this is real leadership. And, and I, think, I think about this all the time, but I think a big part of the problem is the non-Indigenous governments, it's not that they're bad, but they don't have any mechanism to save things that don't make money, like oxygen. <laughs> like standing for us. We always have to calculate how much money is saved or produced by not killing some ecosystem off. But um, so I, there has to be a, and I don't really know how this can be done, but it's happening. For example, in the Broughton right now, correct me if I'm wrong, Krista, but I don't think anything will ever happen in there again for salmon that does not get run through the nations first. That, that has changed whether it's a commercial opening or it is anything. Um, and um, it's not that all First Nation governments are perfect. I don't wanna you know, be somebody that is saying that, but it is the only hope we have. Um, I, it, it's been so remarkable watching these ancient governments reconstitute themselves around the fish. It's just, it's, it's just really, uh, it's not something I looked for. It's not something I expected or was even interested in. I just wanted to look at the whales and then, and then at the salmon. I thought I could just fix this problem, but that was just absolutely wrong. You, 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 you have to work with that local government. And uh, I just wanna say, you know, all through the occupation, there was one hereditary leader, Arthur Dick. Um, he used to contact me and he, he'd say, Alex, don't bring shame to the nations. Don't bring shame mm. to the nation. And I'd be like, okay, are we doing the right thing? He's like, yep, just keep going. And, and it just was so great to have that guide. Um, and then of course, Ernest Alfred, who I think is on here, um, a hereditary leader as well with the protocols and the understanding that, that guided what we did. So uh, yeah, it has to be run through First Nation governments, absolutely. Lalitla, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, you know, for me, um, what I would like to see is, you know, for us to go back to our old ways and, you know, really get that uh, connection back to our territory and our waters and our lands because, you know, that's been a huge, uh, huge wall for a lot of us. Um, you know, we're on these certain reserves now and living in cities and stuff like that. And, you know, there's only very few of us who actually, you know, make the time to actually go into our territory and, you know, connect with the land and the water and, you know, keep our traditions alive with our traditional medicines and stuff like that and you know that was a huge part to why you know we were able to you know really live for so long um before colonization was because we had that connection we listened to you know the fish and everything else that you know, it sustained us and took care of us and we took care of it. And, you know, I think we really do need to get back to that because, you know, our ancestors knew our territory, like the back of their hand and, you know, knew when to fish, knew when not to fish. Um, yeah, so I mean, this government definitely has a lot to learn and you know, if they did actually, you know, take the time to listen to each 
uh, nation um, on what's best for that location, I think this world definitely would be in a lot better shape than what we are in right now. It's eight o'clock right now. So I think I'm gonna sort of shift our dialogue over to some of the questions that we're getting from listeners and people here um, listening in. Um, so I'll just sort of pepper through some of the top questions. Um, what role do salmon play in forests? And these questions can go to either one of you. Sa salmon feed the trees that make the oxygen we breathe. They go out in the open ocean, they collect the energy of the sun hitting the ocean. They store it in their flesh, they climb up the mountains. And after they've made their babies, they die and they just pour that nutrient down over the, over the mountainside. And because the nitrogen from the ocean is different, it can be traced, we see it. There's bigger growth rings on trees with more salmon. Protecting salmon is fighting climate change. If we, if we kill off the wild salmon of this coast, it's like just pulling the electrical cord out of the side of your house. There's all that power is just gone. It, it is just, it's complete insanity and future generations will be like, what were you possibly thinking? Um, so yeah, they're, they're critical. And you know, the forest makes the salmon, the salmon make the forest. It's one of those perfect things. Lily Tless is nodding. I, uh, I remember being in a meeting with the Forest Lands and Natural Resources and Rural Development Ministry office and a bunch of uh, forestry professionals in the Port McNeil office a few years ago, maybe four years ago. And I kept talking about salmon and they were they were confused as to why I was in a forest meeting and talk, kept talking about salmon. Um, and then I started describing this electrical input process and the shape of Vancouver Island and the mountains down the middle of it and all these rivers and estuaries and systems that go up into all the watersheds that feed the bears and the eagles and the birds and the, you know, uh, mycorrhizal fungi and everything in the forest and I described Vancouver Island a bit like a lung and salmon being the oxygen and breathing in and breathing out and never have I seen a group of people look at me like I was so crazy <laughs> as those folks and it was just it was a hard uh it was a hard meeting to see the dissonance between people making land use decisions around forests um not thinking that salmon had much to do with the issues and the concerns of forest management um, but of course, the reason that I put a lot of my life force into fighting for wild salmon in the same breath for the last remaining intact and contiguous watersheds of, of ancient forests are for the same reason. It's the same place. It's the same ecosystem, um, the whales and the bears. Um, this is a classic question. I get this one a lot, too, in my work is like, what do we do? You know, how do we save wild salmon? The big, the big what do you do question. Um, but I'll put a little finer point on it based on, on a question um, is around boycotts and uh, consumer choices. So sh should we be boycotting uh, farmed salmon or companies that own farm salmon operation, Mitsubishi or whatever, like do we need to do market-based uh, campaigning or strategies um, uh, as well, you know, in restaurants and, and different Costco, different places that supply and sell um, farm fish, should we, should we look at that? And should people be actively making those decisions um, with their consumer choices? Uh, so, I mean, this is something I've thought about a lot. Um, it, it, the answer to your question is yes, but to get enough people to do it to affect a multinational company, where the majority of this product is going to California um, or, or to Asia, it, it's hard to get a grip on it, but it certainly is something to do. And 
when you are reaching into that cooler in the, in the supermarket and you're deciding wild or farmed, you are making a critical decision for orca and the other hundred species, including us, um, that depend on wild salmon. Uh, so, it, so it is very important, but right now <laughs> we have a minister of fisheries is going in the right way. And I just think everything we can do do you know, um, I heard from uh, some people in government that a minister of fisheries has never been thanked publicly in the history hmm. of Canada. So Interesting. <laughs> here's your opportunity. Um, and maybe they'll realize when they do the right thing, the people are happy. It's not surprising considering the track record, but yeah, that's a, a compelling concept. Yeah. Yeah. I know, Carissa, you said you wouldn't even feed farm fish to a dog. Um, yeah, so boycotts yeah. in the cards there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, do that, you know, educate yourself more on, you know, how destructive fish farms actually are and, you know, start educating more of your friends, your family, you know, because what I learned during the occupation was you know, a lot of people thought that fish farms were good and that they were saving wild salmon and, yeah. you yeah. know, they didn't see a wrong thing with them until they actually started, you know, following occupation and, you know, educating themselves more. And that's when it really opened a lot of people's eyes. Um, yeah, so just keep educating yourself and educate even strangers in the grocery store. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Big wake up call for me was uh, back when I was doing some reporting work as a writer, I, I covered the, the Don Staniford um, libel case um, where Marine Harvest took him to court for libel um, talking about how farm fish cause cancer. I think that was the phrase that was in question there. And, um, notwithstanding the ruling, seeing the testimony of the uh, nutritionists for EWAS Canada, the fish farm feed making company based in Surrey, um, as to they were testifying as to what goes into the fish farm feed, uh, you know, bones and flesh from industrial cattle slaughterhouses and feathers from uh, you know, industrial chicken farms in Vancouver and Abbotsford, as well as uh, Manhattan fish from the Gulf of Mexico that were run through a coal filtration process to get the PCBs and dioxins and furons out of it to make oil to mix with the feathers. That was all I needed to hear. I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm out, you know? Um, yeah. So I think, yeah, if, 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 if people wanted to take on or if there was an organization or maybe a buyer's group in California or somewhere abroad that where this fish is going, that wanted to take a boycott initiative on, I, I think that would be really welcome and probably a smart, a smart strategy to, um, to employ. Uh, the next question is, is for both of you and it's a, it's a good one. Um, what's your source of inspiration to continue the work after so many people not listening and not paying attention? Where do you get energy? What's your source of inspiration? Well, for me, it's looking out the window because I'm looking right at, you know, this environment and, and the fish. I, I've thought about quitting, absolutely. But, you know, where would I go? Because there's problems everywhere. So, yeah, just looking out the window and seeing what an amazing place it is that is making clean air, clean water, clean food that needs to be protected for for the children of this planet. Yeah, um, for me, it's not only, you know, looking out and actually going out into the territory and, you know, seeing, you know, everything kind of start, slowly starting to heal itself uh, from all the damage, um, but it's our youth, the youth that I get to see and, that I get to be a part of their lives uh, and to see them grow up um, within our culture and just to see how proud they are and, you know, 
I do my best on the daily to, you know, teach what I know to my niece and nephew that I see every day, pretty much. Um, you know, they, they inspire me to push myself to learn more. Um, and yeah, that's, that's my strength is our, our youth and our future generations to come. Um. Mark, I would like to ask, answer one question that went by. And that was, uh, somebody was asking, well, what are we gonna, how, how, are, how is everybody gonna eat salmon if, if we don't have farm salmon? It, it's not everybody's right to eat salmon. You know, that is just not everybody's right. And this is something that we as a species really, uh, and, and as a culture and a society, we gotta get a grip on this. We don't have a right to exploit this planet for, because we all wanna eat one thing. That's never the way it was. That's not the way this thing works. And um, so if, if you know, the salmon farming industry wants to build tanks and create a whole separate ecosystem with no spillover and use their waste to, to grow things, it's, it's still a difficult idea, a difficult concept for me to accept because really if you wanna farm something in the ocean, you should start with algae and then, and then farm a fish that eats the algae and then take the waste of the fish and grow something else. But we do not have the right to eat everything to death on this planet. Um, because you know what, we take that right away from the children. So, I mean, when I hear the old growth logging argument and the loggers saying they can't exist without logging old growth, well, they're not leaving any for their kids. So um, we, we have to act like adults here at some point and, and think about the children. And so I just wanted to answer that question. Everybody can't eat salmon in the world. That's just a fact. Well, it's quarter after here. I'd like to read uh, a passage from uh, your new book that just came out, uh, not on my watch. Um, and then maybe after that, we can you can speak to it or we could just have a couple closing remarks for the night. Um, but this is about your uh, project, this concept of uh, the Department of Wild Salmon. Um, and it's from the last uh, section, the last bit of, of the book. And I, and I wanted to kind of take something from the last section because uh, I want to look forward a little bit. I want to I think about the future of wild salmon and what types of management thinking, what types of relationships we need to cultivate with each other, with the land and with the fish. Um, and you've put a lot of thought into what is a simple but beautiful concept of, of this uh, Department of Wild Salmon as you call it. So um, yeah, let me just read a, a passage here. The Department of Wild Salmon would pay close attention to the people trudging up rivers, climbing over logs and crawling through dense brush to reach, reach salmon runs throughout British Columbia. The eyewitnesses. This science depends on them. And so I would take them into the labs to see what happens with the samples and the data they so arduously collect. As field workers visited the labs, they would find out why, why was it so important to use sterile tools on each fish to take each sample exactly two kilometers apart from the river. Samples taken at precise intervals allow for higher degrees of confidence in statistical results. We would learn more. But forcing a field crew to do more impossible, to do the, more, the impossible destroys morale and weakens the results. So lab technicians working on the samples would need to pull on their own hip waders, try to anchor a boat in a falling tide where it would go around in exactly 90 minutes and help in the gathering. In this way, the technicians in the labs would also gain respect for the challenges faced by the collectors in the field. Working together, they would streamline methods to find a balance between what is optimal and what is possible. The Department of Wild Salmon would facilitate annual gatherings where all teams could share ideas, successes and failures where they could eat together, perhaps hold a salmon dance and create community among the learning the language of the salmon. And finally, all of this would have to be gathered under the, under the auspices of local First Nations. While giving control over happens to salmon runs to First Nations scares some people, consider this. Indigenous governments are entirely focused on, the very, on very specific regions without, without the need to consider international trade. 
This difference is critical to life on Earth. While the big picture is important, it immobilizes governments who are trying to satisfy international corporate needs and keep complex ecosystems functioning to produce clean air, water, and food. We're extremely lucky that the First Nations of British Columbia were not extinguished by colonialism and that they are, com and that they are combing through the ashes, revisiting the secret places, reviving their languages, and seeking wisdom from their elders to rebuild governments based on human and nature as one. I know that many indigenous people reject the word science. I saw the horror on the face of a woman in the ancient salmon, in the ancient salmon drying shack on the banks of, of the Fraser River in Lillooet as I pulled on blue latex gloves and opened up a sterile blade to sample the fish she was preparing for drying racks. But they are scientists in the true sense of the word. They observe, remember, ponder, see and feel that all life is connected. The sacred dances of the animal kingdom are cultural, but they are also biology lessons. All the animals that appear around the fire in the big house, from bears to bottom dwelling fish like sculpins, are part of what happens in this place and why it happens. Here on the Western edge of the North American continent, salmon are the masters at the art of thriving. Through the concept of the Department of Wild Salmon, salmon would become our teachers ensuring that we are finally learn how to thrive because we will only thrive if the world around us thrives. I love that. That's great. Hmm. It's been a, a real honor chatting with both of you this evening, but um, we've got about 10 minutes uh, where the floor is open, either to answer any questions you saw come through the chat or to just talk a little bit further about, um, about what you're thinking about. Um, there was a question that was persistent here from Laura Cromner asking um, what, I think she, I think you said, Laura, what, what works to, to unite First Nation leadership, um, because we're seeing a very different thing happening in the Discovery Islands right now where seven nations are trying to figure out how to deal with consultation and, and with the farms. And then there's what happened with the Broughton archipelago. And I think it just come, I mean, I don't know. I really, you're probably the better one to answer that question, but I think it's just the individuals who are involved. There are people who are very confident in their leadership and, and don't, seem to feel the need to dominate and they're having an extraordinary impact. I know in, in the Broughton, there was an amazing thing that happened and I missed it entirely as usual. I'm looking always in the wrong direction, but I didn't realize that a, a um, uh, debate or controversy or disagreement over territory existed um, between Namgis and Mama Lilikala. And that disagreement was purposely put aside for just this one thing. So they didn't resolve it. They just said, we're gonna put it aside. And when the different chiefs were coming and sitting on the farm at Swanson at the very beginning, I, I didn't grasp the full significance of that until now or till later. But um, that was a very, very important thing that happened because the difficulty we have right now is you've got the Fraser River nations who depend on these salmon coming back to their homes that are running through territories with salmon farms and no nation wants to tell or be told what can happen in their territory by another nation. And so this is a very, very difficult situation, absolutely. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, you know, for a lot of us, you know, there are those, you know, disagreements and arguments between, uh, you know, our tribes within the Kwakwakiwak Nation. And, you know, that's just kind of a thing that happened during colonization. Like we, before we never had boundaries. Um, we never had lines going across a map saying this is ours, that's yours. 
you know, we all, you know, looked after each other because we all had different resources to share so that all of us could, you know, survive. And, you know, we always help each other out. So that, that's always like a huge um, role that a lot of things have changed uh, for our people. And, you know, we're slowly, um, you know, coming coming back together as one. Um, it's been a long time coming and there's still a lot of work to be done, but, you know, one step at a time. And this was definitely one of them for sure. Hmm. Yeah, I certainly, as a mamatla, um, I'm always in sort of a learning stance around how to conduct myself. Um, as a settler in, in indigenous territories and navigating community-based dynamics and needs and, um, and healing. Um, it's been a real gift, uh, a hard but beautiful gift um, to be allowed, um, yeah, to walk in, in these territories and these rivers and to um, learn from, from a Wheatnokwis and a Wheatnokola and the waters of, of Kokakiwak people um yeah if um if people enjoyed the conversation tonight uh we have and host uh webinars on a number of different topics and, and issues um at, at sierra club bc we're always um trying to facilitate the dialogue and move our our, our connections and our relationships forwards um with with Mayahala, uh, and so if if you do like these webinars and you do feel you're in a position where you can donate, uh, please do. Um, alternatively, please contribute to Alex's work. Um, pick up a copy of this book. Um, can you order this online, Alex? Where can people find this book? Yes, you can order it from uh, Penguin Random House, but also you could go to your local bookstore and, and ask for them. Or of course, it's on Amazon with everything else. So, cool. yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah, support your local bookstore if you can. Um, and uh, more and more, we'll be, we'll be folding, folding out bigger and better projects with uh, Tlalikla. So I'm excited for, for what we're going get to get into in the territory in the next a uh, year or so, so stay tuned. Um, lots of good work ahead and lots of good work behind. So, Kayla Kuzla, everyone, um, I think I think we'll just wrap. It's wonderful. Great to work with both of you tonight. Thanks, everybody, for being here and the great questions. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Kayla Kuzla, everyone, uh, thank you for taking the time out of your lives tonight to join us. Um, to learn more. Um, yeah. My hila hints a wheat nakula. Respect the land, sky, and the sea. Gila Gesla. Gila Gesla.